So let me set the stage for you just a bit. Three years of drought, the political and religious maneuverings of the evil King Ahab. Once upon a time in Israel, it sounds like a movie, right? Right off the bat. And this evil King Ahab has helped Israel get into a bad spot. They have begun to worship the local god of agriculture, the god of rain, Baal. And Elijah, the prophet of God, convinces Ahab to get everybody together so that they can settle it once and for all. And and I mean everybody, all of Israel and including the 450 prophets of Baal. He calls them out all to Mount Carmel. Let, let's read together our passage this morning from 1 Kings, the 18th chapter. So Ahab summoned everyone in Israel, particularly the prophets, to Mount Carmel. Elijah challenged the people How long are you going to sit on the fence? If God is the real God, follow him. If it's Baal, follow him. Make up your minds. Nobody said a word. Nobody made a move. Then Elijah said, I'm the only prophet of God left in Israel, and there are 450 prophets of Baal. Let the Baal prophets bring up two oxen. Let them pick one, butcher it, and lay it out on an altar on firewood. But don't ignite it. I'll take the other ox, cut it up, and lay it on the wood, but neither will I light the fire. Then you pray to your gods, and I'll pray to God. The God who answers with fire will prove to be, in fact, God. All the people agreed, a good plan, do it. Elijah told the Baal prophets, choose your ox and prepare it. You go first, you're the majority. Then pray to your God, but, but don't light the fire. So they took the ox he had given them, prepared it for the altar, then prayed to Baal. They prayed all morning long, oh, Baal, answer us, but nothing happened. Not so much as a whisper of breeze. Desperate, they jumped and stomped on the altar they had made. By noon, Elijah had started making fun of them taunting, call a little louder. He is a God after all. Maybe he's off meditating somewhere or other, or maybe he's gotten involved in a project, or maybe he's on vacation. You don't suppose he's overslept, do you? He needs to be waked up. They prayed louder and louder, cutting themselves with swords and knives, a ritual common to them, until they were covered with blood. This went on until well past noon. They used every religious trick and strategy they knew to make something happen on the altar, but nothing happened. Not so much as a whisper, not a flicker of response. Then Elijah told the people, enough of that. It's my turn. Gather around. And they gathered. He then put the altar back together, for by now it was in ruins. Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes of Jacob, the same Jacob to whom God had said, from now on, your name is Israel. He built the stones into the altar in honor of God. Then Elijah dug a fairly wide trench around the altar. He laid firewood on the altar, cut up the ox, put it on the wood, and said, fill four buckets with water and drench both the ox and the firewood. Then he said, do it again, and they did it. Then he said, do it a third time, and they did it a third time. The altar was drenched, and the trench was filled with water. When it was time for the sacrifice to be offered, Elijah the prophet came up and prayed, O God, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, 
Make it known right now that you are God in Israel, that I am your servant, and that I'm doing what I'm doing under your orders. Answer me, God. Oh, answer me and reveal to this people that you are God, the true God, and that you are giving these people another chance at repentance. Immediately the fire of God fell and burned up the offering, the wood, the stones, the dirt, and even the water in the trench. All the people saw it happen and fell on their faces in awed worship, exclaiming, God is the true God. God is the true God. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks. Would you pray with me? Well, God, in these moments, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to you. That we would acknowledge, as we sang just a moment ago, that our feet will never take us deep enough on our own. My words will never take us deep enough on our own. And so, God, I pray that you would, in fact, speak through me, and if need be, in spite of me, so that we would hear your word this morning. Amen. So last week, I had the opportunity to introduce myself to you, standing right about here, and um, among many other things I shared with you, one of those was that I really love movies. Um, and I, and I wanted to say this morning that I, I especially love Westerns. Anybody else Western fans? Oh, oh wow, just a smattering. Oh, this is not going to, no, I'm just kidding. No, it's fine. The whole thing's not about Westerns, I promise. But I, I wanted to tell you just a bit about that because I, I just love Westerns. There's just something about the Old West that is always sort of called to me, something about the, the expansion of the frontier and the challenges of survival, knocking heads with community and law and all of those things. I mean, I just, I love the Western genre. And, and I particularly love sort of a subset of Westerns, uh, commonly referred to as spaghetti Westerns. And spaghetti, oh, see, okay, some of you have heard of it, some of you haven't, think I'm making that up. But spaghetti Westerns are this, this grouping of movies uh, made almost entirely in the, in the 60s and 70s, um, and, and they're unique because even though their stories tend to take place in the American Southwest, like most Westerns, these are films that were largely filmed in Italy or Spain and by Italian studios, hence the name Spaghetti Westerns. And it, there's just something about them, the, their pace, the, the score, the, the themes that they explore that I just love. They just, they speak to me and really, ama- I just, I love them. And, and I say all that because I, I hope that it gives you some explanation of why as I was Preparing for this morning, all I could think about was this. And see, that's, that's Clint Eastwood as the man with no name. And he is getting ready to back up into this great show. Now, slowly, ever so slowly backing up into this impossibly broad, ambitiously dangerous morbid setting with Tuco and Angel Eyes and Blondie just staring each other down with excessively slow movements and and tight camera work and an incredible score and surrounded morbidly by a by a cemetery. Or maybe even better to go with our series Once Upon a Time in Israel, how about Once Upon a Time in the West? Charles Bronson's harmonica staring down the henchman that Frank has sent to meet him in the opening scene at the railroad station. And maybe if you love these movies too, that you look at these images and you can feel it. The, the tension and the excitement and the anticipation. Maybe, maybe you can even, as I do when I look at this scene, Hear the Ennio Morricone soundtrack building amongst the, the distant trains and the buzzing flies and the creaking windmill. Maybe, maybe you're at the edge of your seat just wondering what is going to happen next. And, and maybe not. Maybe you don't like Westerns at all and these aren't speaking to you at all. And that's fine. 
because we have quite a showdown of our own from Scripture this morning. The location is, is very different. It's not at a train station. It's not in the thoroughfare of a new and growing frontier town. I think it's safe to say the outfits were probably very different. I doubt any cowboy hats or dusters were there that afternoon. But I do believe that that tension was no less palpable and the stakes were much, much higher. And much like those dramatic showdowns that take place in Westerns, almost invariably, the best of them aren't self-serving. They signify something much deeper that's happening. They are going to resolve something that has been building, something greater than what we see on the surface. And certainly that is the case when we encounter Elijah staring down an idolatrous king and hundreds of Baal's prophets. As the town folk, excuse me, not the town folk, as God's chosen people, Israel, gathered round to watch. On the surface, uh, the showdown seems to be like it's between Elijah and the other prophets. I mean, they're the ones that are competing after all. They're the ones who are about to go head to head. Or or you might say, digging just a bit deeper, that the showdown is between Baal and God. Who's going to show up? Who's going to respond to the sacrifice and the call for fire? But really, the the true showdown is, is more familiar. In fact, it's more personal. And it's taking place over and over again in the hearts and minds of those gathered. In the hearts and minds of those to whom Elijah asks right at the start, how long are you going to sit on the fence? If God is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. But make up your mind. In other words, the the showdown at Mount Carmel is to resolve something that has been building for years, a question that needs answering. Who is the true God? So idolatry is not something that we talk a lot about these days. The kind of of, of straightforward worship and idols and other gods that that might come to mind when you hear the word idolatry, um, that's something we just encounter in Scripture. It's something that we we tend to relegate to another time. And I don't think it's really on our radar so much. We'd we'd prefer to believe, if nothing else, that if we found ourselves in in the midst of a three-year drought, we would in fact resist King Ahab and his machinations. We would resist the calls to worship Baal, the, the Canaanite agricultural god, the giver of rain. That when Elijah turned to us, that we would in fact stand with him immediately that we would stand against the prophets of Baal, that in response to his question, how long will you sit on the fence? We would declare, well, right now we want to follow God. God only, God completely. We want to follow God. But, But idols haven't gone away and really far from it. I think it'd be more accurate to say that idols and idolatry have have multiplied, have taken on more palatable and acceptable forms as their clever purveyors find new ways to invite us to fence-sitting. Today, there are countless Ahabs offering to us another option or a different solution. We want to follow God completely and God only, But there are so many voices that claim to be God's voice. There are so many ways that profess to be God's ways. There are so many communities that profess to be God's people. Augustine famously wrote that our hearts are restless until they find their rest in God, who we were made for. But that, that restlessness, that, that emptiness, 
That, that emotional or spiritual drought that many of us have experienced in our lives, that deep drought that you might be experiencing right now, that drought has a whole lot of contenders to step in and try to satisfy. And here's the thing. I could spend all morning going on and on about how empty idols are, how worthless they are. And, and really, our, our passage sets us up for that quite nicely. What better place to start than with Elijah's taunting? Call a little louder. He's a god after all. Maybe he's, maybe he's off meditating somewhere. Maybe he's on vacation. You don't suppose he's overslept, do you? Do we need to, do we need to wake him up? Let's give credit where credit is due. Elijah was a lot of things. And one of those things is he was a great trash talker, right? I mean, for hours, for hours, hundreds of prophets of Baal have called upon their God with no response. Scripture says not even a whisper. And Elijah is more than happy to point that out to everybody there, happy to whip them up into an even greater frenzy and further prove the utter powerlessness of Baal. Prove that idols are without authority and have no capacity to bless. But remember that Elijah's most important audience are the believers the believers gathered there at Mount Carmel, the believers gathered here at Trinity. This exorbitant contest with the prophets, it's all for the people of Israel to help them get off the fence, to keep them from from trying to serve God and serve Baal at the same time. They still consider themselves God's chosen people, but, but somewhere along the way, At some point during Ahab's manipulative rule and this dangerous multi-year drought, they thought they they might give Baal some attention as well. Just Just a little bit of their obedience. I mean, look, not all, of course, but... But some appreciation might be worth trying towards this lowercase g God that the political powers were pushing and that the culture was slowly moving them to. And that, that, my friends, if we're honest with ourselves, that sounds familiar. Because... Long before any of us might say, you know what, maybe I'm a polytheist. Long before any of us might declare a conscious or intentional worship of something other than God, we can very easily slip into idolatry. Even even the best intentioned of, of us, yes, us, those of us here gathered this morning for Christian worship we are also at times pulled towards a reverence for the powers and principalities of the world. We don't think of it as worship, but but when there are other paths, better paved, smoother paths that that sure look like they're taking us to the exact same places anyways, well, we can we can quickly find ourselves straddling the same fences as those Elijah ministered to on Mount Carmel. We find ourselves seeking security or prosperity or or even the most beautiful, selfless, holy outcomes while placing our hope and trust in things other than God. How long are you going to sit on the fence? If God is the real God, follow. If it's Baal, follow Baal, but make up your minds. Perhaps it doesn't feel like worship to us when this happens because it's, it's different. That we, don't, we don't gather as obviously around a table that, that holds different elements, elements of, of our pride and other closely held beliefs. We may not see it as worship because we don't literally kneel in prayer to the security we seek or the or the status we hold but but anything anything that begins to take priority in our lives over our service to god over our love for god and our love for neighbor 
those things become idols, and we have begun to worship them. Even Jesus warned that his message might separate us, not just from those we consider our enemy or people we'd like to be separated from. No, he says uh, his message might separate us from our, even our closest family because God knows anything can be deformed into an idol. Even the very best of things used wrongly can come between us and God. Nearly 3,000 years after Mount Carmel, we still need to hear Elijah's call to get off the fence, to become aware of the idols that stand between us and our acknowledgement that God is the true and only God. And, And Elijah does more than simply call us home or call us back to faithfulness, but he does so in such a way that he also shows us how. Look again or think again about the difference between his preparations and those of the Baal prophets. Following hours of an elaborate and destructive jumping and stomping, the crescendo of ever louder prayers literally soaking themselves in their own blood, peppered with every religious trick and strategy from their playbook, compared to that, Elijah's preparation is, is one of quiet and humility. He begins by remembering what God has done for him and for God's chosen people, placing 12 stones, hearkening back to when God set apart Jacob and the 12 tribes of Israel. And he prays. He prays not not for his glory, but for God's glory. And he he prays not for the, the punishment of those who had been led astray, but for their chance at repentance. And he also does something that strikes me somewhere between odd and incredible. He calls for the altar and the ox and even the wood to be drenched in water and even digs a wide trench around it all so that the water won't run away or dry up, but will in fact settle there. And this seems like a pretty dramatic performance for the benefit of those that have gathered. Maybe it's even a less than subtle continuation of his trash talking. Here we're back to it, right? By the way, I am absolutely convinced that Elijah would have made a great WWE wrestler. Can you imagine how epic his routine would be as he came out from backstage and made his way down to the ring? It's incredible. He has a gift for it, is all I'm saying. More fans of Westerns than wrestling. I'm making a note of that. All right. But that afternoon at Mount Carmel... Water is repeatedly poured over the newly repaired altar, the same one that 450 Baal prophets couldn't ignite. It's soaked in water so that there will be no doubt a moment later when the fire of God falls and consumes the offering and the wood, even the stones and the dirt. There will be no doubt that those flames are not an accident. But it's also more than that. The faithfulness of Elijah's response lies in standing against the logical leanings of Israel toward this God of rain. They are in the midst of a three-year drought. He stands in the midst of crops and people weary with thirst and then repeatedly pours buckets of water on the altar and the ground. Even more than emphasizing the power of God and impressiveness of the coming miraculous fire, the drowning of the altar with precious water is Elijah actively standing faithful even in the face of this terrible drought, relying on none other than God. God shows up. Fire 
falls from the sky, consumes it all. And in the verses following our passage, a storm rolls in and the drought is over. What is it for you? What, what's the drought that wears on you? And, and where have you turned? In the throes of thirst, have you found another solution? Are there, are there practices or principles in your life that, that are becoming idols? You need to, to get off the fence? I know I do. I, I don't trust God as deeply or fully as I should, and I can be quick to rely on other things. But I'm reminded again and again of all that God has done for me, again and again. And as we are all reminded, as we seek to grow in our willingness to trust God, even when we see other options that might seem more practical or relevant or popular, we can get off the fence. And we can then be present for the power of God, letting nothing stand between us and God's faithfulness. We can be sustained by trusting in God and God alone and join the celebration, join in the awed worship in response. God is the true God. God is the true God. Pray with me. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So God, forgive us our wandering loyalties and draw us back to you. As we find ourselves hungering and thirsting and as countless cures are laid before us, Help us to rely on you. And as more practical and popular options present themselves, help us to trust you and you alone. You alone are God.